on, come on, clap your hands and praise him. Jesus, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. ghost in this place, turn to your neighbor and say he's here. Turn to another neighbor and say, I know he's here. Praise God. Amen. Let's give that choir a great big hand for doing an incredible job. Hallelujah. My, my. Didn't we have a time last night? Come on, young people. Didn't we have a time last night? I believe that same God, that same spirit is right here in this place tonight. Now, this is the last night service. And I believe that the Lord is going to minister to us because when you leave this place, you're going to adventure from here and go to every place of purpose in your life, God's going to direct you, but more than that, He's going to empower you to do great things in the kingdom. Aren't you glad you're a part of the kingdom of God? Come on, aren't you glad you're a part of the kingdom of God? Yes! Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. I want to say, if you want to return to your seats, that's fine, but please continue to worship the Lord. If you want to stay up here, that's up to you. Amen. But I do want to say what an honor and a privilege it has been to be here with you this week. And I'm so thankful for the power and the Spirit of the Lord that has joined us. I'm so thankful for your leadership. Give Brother Vic and this powerful youth committee a great big hand. We love and appreciate Brother and Sister Vic. Amen. And I'm thankful for all the friendships that I have uh, been able to receive since being on this campground. Met some incredible folks. And uh, you know they're your friend when they request to follow you on Twitter. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, I, I met somebody on the campground, but I don't know. Wait, they're going to follow me on Twitter? Oh, yeah, they're, they're, we're friends now. That's the friend gauge right there. Hey, no, they're your friend, not because they stand up for you, but because they follow you on Twitter. <laughs> Amen. Facebook friends, Twitter friends, whatever. Either way, I'm glad that I've met some wonderful people. The Wisconsin district is a phenomenal district in the United Pentecostal Church International. Come on, you ought to clap your hands and shout, yes! Amen. I have been treated so kind, and I am so thankful for all the friendships and everything. And, and uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'll follow you on Twitter too. Amen. One day I'm going to create my own social networking site. I'm going to combine YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook and call it You Twit Face. Anybody want to do that? <laughs> 
So glad to have a great friend of my family, Brother Mike Hook. Give Brother Hook a great big hand. We love him. <laughs> now, Brother, Brother Hook has known me since I was a little boy, and that's only been a couple weeks ago. No, he's known me since I was a kid. And uh, his family and my family, I'm glad he's here tonight. So glad to see him and, and uh, love and appreciate him very much. Amen. Now, this is the last time that I'm going to preach to you, and I want to ask you, will you let me preach to you tonight? Can I preach to you tonight? Because this is a great group of young people, and uh, the music has been great all week. Amen. I'm so thankful. Brother, Seth, Brother Rainbow, I'm so thankful for him. Give yeah, Brother Rainbow and his other glory. We're making memories. I better move on before I start crying. I'll try not to preach lazy tonight, brother. I love them. Turn with me in your Bibles if you have them. I hope that you do. Amen. To the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 beginning with verse number 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3 beginning with verse number 1. I want to preach to you tonight, and I hope that the Spirit of the Lord encourages you and that you go from this place with a true definition about who you are and what we stand for. I'm thankful for apostolic identity. I'm thankful for apostolic identity. I'm thankful that I do not have to be ashamed of anything. I'm not ashamed of the way I live. I'm not ashamed of... Come on, somebody. I, I'm here tonight to have church. I've been with Brother Chad Williams all afternoon. We've been hanging out together. We've been having church this afternoon. I'm ready to have church right now. My hard drive crashed on my computer. I'm ready to kick the devil in the teeth. My Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parent, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers, listen to this, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. He didn't say they didn't love God. He said they love pleasure more than they love God. And notice this next one, having a form of godliness but denying the power, everybody say power, everybody say truth, denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive, silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Notice verse number seven. Ever learning, somebody say ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of, of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. These scriptures tell us about the trend of the last day. These scriptures tell us about the trend of the last day day and we are seeing that trend right now because we are living in the last day come on anybody else believe that we are living in the last day I believe that the battle that rages today is not as much with truth and untruth or the right doctrine and false doctrine but what we're fighting today is a battle between truth and trend. So I want to talk to you with the help of the Lord tonight from that subject. I want to talk about the battle between truth and trend. Amen. If you believe in the truth, I want you to lift your hands, lift your voice, and everybody help me pray right now. Come on, help me pray. Jesus, I love you. I thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. God, you are here to minister to every life, to every heart. God, I want you to put a love for the truth, for the gospel of Jesus Christ within us. 
that we will not sell, that we will not give away. I'm thankful for the power of your spirit. Speak to this group of young people. Speak to these adults. Speak to this district. Help us to have revival like never before. In Jesus' name, if you want to have revival, I want you to clap your hands and shout in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say it in Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing and worshiping the Lord. It seems as if the battle between good and evil has always raged. After sin entered the picture, the conflict has been never-ending. Humanity began with the inborn desire to please God. But when the option came along to please somebody other than God, namely one's own self, things drastically changed. Now today, pleasing God isn't enough. Today, people have to try to please everybody else. Today, people work very hard and they sacrifice a lot just to please somebody else. Eve, the Bible tells us, was beguiled by the serpent and he told her of a better way. He told her of an easier way. It's as if Lucifer was talking to her saying things like, you don't need to go through God anymore. You can become a God yourself. He said, stop trying to look at everything as God tells you to look and start looking for yourself. You can almost hear that old devil say in the text, God doesn't understand you because he is not you. How can God be understanding to who you are? How can he be, how can he be sensitive to who you are? You are not him. He made you lower than him. You can understand good and evil if you'll just take a bite of that fruit. You can finally be relevant to yourself. I'm going to tell you the battle that rages today is a battle between people and God because people want to be relevant and God says, I'm the thing that's relevant. People say, I want to be relevant to culture. If you've got God in your life, you are relevant to culture. There's not a thing I can do or a thing I can say that can be any more relevant than the power and the gospel of Jesus Christ in my life. Come on, somebody, clap your hands if you believe that. We have been in a downward spiral ever since. Today, the problem has grown to unscalable proportion. Man pulls out all the stops to please himself. He'll do whatever it takes to make his flesh happy. Some people you can't get to come to church, but they'll sacrifice time and money and families just to please their own flesh. I want you to hear me tonight. When you go back home and you go back to your school, you need to remember something. If the world demands more of you than what you're giving to God, there is something wrong with that picture. Well, I can't go to church because I got this practice. I can't go to church because I got that practice. You need to hear what I'm saying. You need to stand up and say, I'm not worried about pleasing this world. I'm not worried about keeping up with the Joneses. I'm worried about pleasing God. The devil wants you doing what everybody else is doing. But here's the facts. I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. I want to do what God wants me to do. Living for God's kind of like living for God's kind of like walking up a downward escalator. Anybody ever done that? It's not the easiest thing to do. You know what's really weird about walking up an escalator that's going down? That you're moving in between all kinds of people. Every one of them are going down, but you're going up. It's hard to do. They're all looking at you like you're funny. They're looking at you like you're ridiculous. It's kind of like living for God. Everybody else in this world may be going down, but I'm going to do my best to make it up. I'm going to do my, I don't care if they look at me funny. I don't care if they call me crazy. I am crazy. I'm crazy in love with pleasing Jesus Christ. I got to go up. I have no direction to go but up. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
The problem today is when man had the opportunity and took the opportunity to know both good and evil, he started operating more in evil than he did good. And this idea sadly began to creep into the church. There are church organizations and movements all over the world today that they don't just have church anymore. They've replaced having church with having gatherings. They don't call it church. They call it conversations. I'm sorry, but I don't want to go to a church that just has a gathering. A group of idiots can get in a circle and it's called a gathering. I don't want to go to a gathering. I want to go. Oh, I wish I had somebody to help me right here. I don't want to go to a conversation. I want to go to a church. I'm telling you this because the world wants to change the way that you have church in the name of trend and fashion. But I'm preaching to you that Jesus designed this church to go in one direction. I didn't die for this church and I don't have the right to change it. Well, Brother Maroney, we just need to make it more relevant. We just need to make it easier for people to come into it. You listen to me, friend. Coming out from sin has never been easy. If a person said, well, I came out from sin and it was easy, that person never came out from sin. All I know is when I came out, it left some battle scars. But they're there to remind me of what Jesus Christ has brought me through. Every time I look in the mirror, I can see where he brought me from. Every, every time I look at my scars, I know Jesus loved me enough to deliver me. Woo! They want to make it easy. But this has not, any time you try to make the gospel easy, you belittle it and you weaken it. 1 Corinthians 1 and 17. Paul said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. But Notice what he says next. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. With the gospel, the truth, when it is reduced to nothing more than something that you can discover or purchase online or pick up at some kind of one-stop shop gathering, you don't really have the truth. You listen to me. That With the introduction of the World Wide Web, there are so many ideas out there about God and about church, you don't even have to ask anybody anymore. All you got to do is get online and start surfing. And somewhere, somehow, you're going to stumble across somebody who's going to give you their idea of the church. And as you're surfing, you got all these ideas coming in, trying to tell you, well, that looks easier. Well, that looks better. Listen to me, friend. It's not easier and it's not better. You cannot belittle the truth. Listen, you may not like what I'm about to say, but the power and the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be reduced to 140 characters. We don't have Twitter church. We don't have Facebook church. Why are you saying that? Because some young people want to get on Facebook and argue about all the things of God, but they won't sit in an office and ask their pastor who who is responsible for their soul, but you want to find out what she says. You want to see what he said. Well, if we could just live like them, why don't we do it like the church across town? I want you to listen to me. The gospel will not be publicized on the Internet and be any good. They want to make it easy. They want to make it easy, Brother Vic. They want you to have church online so you don't have to show up to the house of God. They want you to show up online and just be there watching it happen. Let me tell you the problem with that. There's no altar online, friend. You're not accountable to anybody online. I'm talking about trend. 
I'm talking about trend. It's happening right now. There are so many churches spread. Everybody's a Christian today. And they don't know beans about Christ. All they know is some harebrained idea about what this person said, that person said. It sounded good to them, and so they said, okay, that's what we want. I'm going to tell you what we need, and this is the truth. The church needs a God culture today like never before. I don't want this world's culture. I want a God culture. I want to come to a church where I can fall on my face at an altar and he can hear my voice. I can shed tears of compassion. I can speak in tongues. I can run and dance and shout. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, I want some young person right now to scream at the top of their lungs, you got the right to live in this truth. Hallelujah. Jesus. God said, I will destroy the wisdom of man. Technology is at such a state today that just about anybody at any age can do anything with technology. Went today to get the hard drive replaced on my computer. It was a sad state of affairs, but like Job, God blessed me with one three times bigger than the one I had before. Hallelujah. But I purposely. But I took, my, my iPhone was down because it, I was syncing it when it crashed, and so whatever, long story. Anyway, my iPhone was down. So I took it back there to the window, and there's a dude sitting back there with glasses because all nerds wear glasses. Just kidding. So I take it back there, and I said, can you hook my phone up to your computer, put the software back on it so that I can have, a, have my phone back? He said, sure. He turns around and gives it. Watch this, to a 13 or 14 year old boy. Now immediately, I wanted to say, excuse me, son, son, that's my phone. <laughs> I don't let my three-year-olds play with it, and you ain't going to play with it neither. That's what I wanted to say. But then I started listening to him. He was talking about SAACs and SDACs and and all kinds of computer lingo that I didn't even understand. I thought I was pretty computer literate. I'm a complete idiot compared to this 14-year-old that fixed my phone. He was plugging this wire into that wire. He was working on a computer, had a hard drive pulled out, had the motherboard pulled out. He was talking in stuff. It sounded like French to me. And I'm going, this 14-year-old kid knows more about a computer than I do. He knows more about technology than I do because what technology wants to do is make everything easier for everybody. Now, I'm not against it. Again, I'm preaching from an iPad. I just love technology. But you listen to what I'm saying. There will never be a time in this life where technology replaces a true and a genuine move of the Holy Ghost in my life. It will never happen. Now, hold that applause. Hold that applause because you may not like this, but I want to let you in on a secret. We can have church without multimedia. We can have church without lights. We can have church. We can shut it all down and still have a move of the Holy Ghost because I don't worship trend. I'm in the truth. There is a constant struggle and there is a constant pressure to be like every other church in the world. But I got news for you, apostolics. You ain't like every other church in the world. Oh, but they're running thousands of people and they got all this technology and all this wonderful stuff. You listen to what I'm saying. You cannot have the best of both worlds. And I came to the realization that people that came to my church wanted the best multimedia, the most up-to-date songs, and the best of all that frilly stuff that they could get their hands on, they can go to a thousand other places and get it better than I can give them. But when they step foot into an apostolic Pentecostal church, 
They may have come from multimedia, but they're going to get a genuine dose of the Spirit of God. You can't reproduce it. You can't replicate it. It is original. You cannot make a copy of it. Here's a problem. Too many people today, they just want a copy of it. I want to come in. I want to speak in tongues. I want to dance. I want to run. I want all the goosebumps. But don't you dare ask me to live holy and godly when I walk in this world. They want a portion of what you have. So they'll do whatever they can to mimic what you have. Why are you telling us this, Brother Maroney? Just because they say they speak in tongues doesn't mean they're just like you. There's going to be a temptation greater than today to be just like everybody else. God doesn't want you like everybody else. He wants you separated. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1 that the whole earth was of one language and one speech. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Listen to this. They said one to another, Go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach heaven, and let us make us a name. Now listen, these are people that God created. Technically, they already had a name, but that name wasn't good enough. They wanted something higher. They wanted to build something that stood out. They wanted to be separate from what God was wanting to do in their lives. God said, if they build this tower, it's going to be trouble. He said, the Bible says that the Lord came down to check on them. Listen, how much trouble you got to be getting into, you make the Lord come off his throne and show up at your house. I remember when I was a kid and I used to mess around, my dad used to say, boy, don't make me get out of this recliner. You make me get out of this recliner, you're going to regret me getting out of this recliner. God was saying, kids, don't make me get out of this throne. Don't make me get out of this throne. I come down there, I'm going to have to pass judgment on you. And you know what he did? He came down and he said, here's the deal. When everybody tries to be the same thing, he said it's got the wrong motive behind it. So he made them separate. He confused their language. He gave them all different speech. And they had to, listen, they had to stop depending in themselves. And they had to start depending on God. Listen to what I'm telling you. If we're all the same as everybody else, we're all going to be serving each other. But I'm not living for each other. I'm living for God. That's why I'm in this. I didn't come to serve you. You didn't come to worship me. We're... We're here to serve Jesus Christ. That's who I live for. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, again, it wasn't that they just wanted to build a tower. They wanted a name. They didn't want the status quo. The status quo of God. They wanted to be different. They wanted to be original in and of themselves. And that action alone was sin. Listen to me. When the church tries to step out of God's boundaries and tries to make itself a product of itself, God gets very possessive about his word and his people. You are God's people. This is God's truth. He's going to fight for you as long as you stay in it. But friend, when you start having all kinds of problems, it might be because you're stepping outside of God's boundaries. I got to stay in the truth. The world wants me to be trendy. But God wants me to stay in the truth. The world wants salvation from evil, but they want the option to live evil at the same time. This is why the Lord flooded the earth, because it it was apparent 
that their own ideas, their own agendas, and their own imagination became greater than the relationship with the one that created them. I want you to hear me, friend. Don't let anybody tell you that another pizza party is going to save your generation. Don't let anybody tell you that another lock-in is going to save your generation. Let me tell you what's going to save your generation. You staying all night at the church, praying on your face, teaching a Bible study, giving to somebody in need, that is what's going to save your generation. Oh, you need to come to our youth group. We got black lights and disco balls and we got puppet shows and we roller skate and we dance on our head and, and all that. That ain't going to save your generation. Now, all that stuff's fun stuff. I think it's fine. Knock yourself out. But if it ever replaces them, I know young people that they'll show up for every party, but they're not going to be there on prayer night. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me right now. They'll show up for every fun thing. Oh, but I, I can't make it. I got to work on prayer night. What's going to change your generation is you stepping away from trend and you marrying up with truth. Well, Brother Maroney, I've got a little bit of truth. I've got truth. I know what the truth is. The Bible talks about ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. The ones that were foolish, do you know why they were so dumb? It wasn't because they didn't have any oil. It's because they didn't have enough. Some of you came to this camp, you think you got enough oil. God's saying you don't have enough to make it. You better not leave this campground until you have enough oil in your lamp to make it. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to leave until I meet God's expectations. I'm not going to leave until... I feel an incredible preaching spirit right now. You know what makes me want to do it? It makes me want to go. Come on, improv team. You are not going to make it just because you do it two or three days a week. you got to live this thing on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, every day of the week. You better be apostolic. You better buy the truth and sell it not one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Does that a trend? That's truth. You cannot reduce the gospel to an opinionated subject on the web. It is not a talking point. It is not something you could just hear and say, well, that's interesting, and then dismiss it. When you hear the truth, you are then held accountable by the truth. Too many people think they can hear it and then just do whatever they want. When you hear it, God knows you hear it, and if you choose not to live it, he will judge you for that. <laughs> you cannot reduce what is real. It cannot be copied. It cannot be splashed on a screen and just hope that somebody repents. I still believe in an altar. Altars may not be trendy. Altars may be comfortable for some people. But every time I've ever read about an altar in the Bible, something died on it. Oh, come on somebody, listen to what I'm saying. Every time I ever read about an altar, nobody just came and stood over it and just lifted their hands and acted like they were half dead. I've wanted to push folks over just for doing that. I'm not making fun of the way people worship. If it's real worship, it's going to hurt. Oh, come on, somebody. Is this all right, Brother Vic? If it is genuine worship... You are going to feel it, every stick, every prod. Things die on an altar. My God, things bleed on an altar. I'm not going to make this altar so comfortable.
When you walk up to an altar, it's time to have a change. When you walk up to an altar, it's time for some redirection. When you walk up to an altar, it's time for you to say, God, take everything that is trendy and rip it out of my hands. Take, woo, take everything that is fashionable and take it away from me. If I love my iPod more than God, take it away from me. If I love her or him more than God, take it away from me. If I love this lifestyle more than God, take it away from me. Because there's a battle between truth and trend. And truth is going to win. Paul said in the last days, perilous times shall come. He gave us a list of everything we see in the world today. He said they're going to have a form of godliness, but they're going to deny the power thereof. I can walk into any church anywhere that doesn't preach the truth and see 5,000 people or more doing what looks like they're having church. They're not having church. Having church is when you say, God, this is not about me just clapping my hands. This is not about me just running around the aisles. This is about me having a lifestyle that will separate from the world. That when I leave this altar, I'm going to be a new person. He said they're ever learning and they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. He's talking about the last days. Now I love what he says in verse number 8. Sit down for just a minute. In verse number 8, he calls out two men that were mentioned in the book of Exodus, but nobody ever talked about their names. But their names were very important. They had a very, very special place in Israel's history. Their names were passed down. Their names were Janus and Jambres. They were the magicians that were in Pharaoh's court. And they were employed by Pharaoh. That if at any time that Israel thought they were going to break free and escape, they would use magic and sorcery to scare them back into submission, into their place. When Moses and Aaron showed up to deliver the children of Israel, they had a couple tricks up their sleeve. Moses took a rod... And he threw it down and it turned into a snake. You know what Pharaoh's magicians did? They did the exact same miracle. I've always wondered why God let that happen. I'd have thought maybe, maybe it would have been cool if instead of that rod turning into a serpent, it would have turned into a platypus. I thought maybe... If he'd have turned it into a a possum or something, wouldn't that have been funny? Or maybe if he'd have turned it into a a muskrat, that would have been just so cool. But instead, it turned into a serpent. It mimicked the miracle of God. But make no mistake, it might have looked like it was from God, But it was not from God. Janice and Jambres rolled their sleeves up. They said, we got this. We got this. Go ahead and pull another one. Well, God did pull another one. And when the plagues came, they couldn't match the plagues. Come on, somebody. When God's truth, listen, you can mimic the miracles. You can mimic all the frilly stuff and the magic. But when judgment shows up, you can't mimic that. I wish I had somebody that heard what I'm saying right here. When judgment shows up, you're going to wish you had the truth. You're going to say, get rid of Janice and Jambres. Bring back Moses. Bring back Aaron. Bring back the truth. If we have a revival of truth in our churches, we will not be able to contain the people. Do you know why? Because people don't want a cotton candy religion. They don't want sugar hot air with no substance. 
something that tastes good right now but disappears down the road. Listen, you can have all the great songs and lights and music and hoo and ha all you want to, but when I'm at my lowest point, I need truth. When I'm at my lowest point, I don't need magic. I don't need smoke and mirrors. My God, I need truth. Woo! I'm so thankful for truth. Proverbs 24 and 19. I'm getting ready to close. Music, please come. Proverbs 24 and 19. Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. Stand with me if you would. Stand with me and listen to these scriptures. Neither be thou envious at the wicked. Listen carefully. Don't talk to your neighbor. Listen right here. For thou shalt not be a reward for the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. My son, fear Thou the Lord and the King. Here you go. And meddle not with them that are given to change. Listen. For their calamity shall rise suddenly. And who knoweth the ruin of them both. I am not going to meddle with things that are given to change. If you'll just let down on how you look to the world, you will grow. That's a lie from the enemy. You think the world that's lost and hurting and dying, you think they want to come into a church that does everything just like they do it? They want something different. Listen to me, apostolic. They want something real. They want something genuine. They don't want something that's just like they got. You don't listen. The temptation of the enemy is if you become more like the world, you will win the world. No. You come, you become more like the world, you will fail and fall like the world. But if you separate yourself from the world in that your lifestyle is different and that you live in the truth. You, my friend, will save the world. When you're hungry, some of you looking at me like you don't believe what I'm talking about. You got to start believing in yourself. Listen to what I'm saying. When I'm hungry, I'm going to where the real food is. Nothing I hate worse than being invited to a party and all they got is a few crackers and some little hors d'oeuvres and... Are you kidding me? Never invite a fat boy to a party where there ain't pizza and nachos and cheeseburgers and fried chicken. What is the matter with y'all? I want to go where there is substance. There is nothing like walking into an apostolic church where the power of God falls from heaven and says, I don't care what you look like. I don't care how you're dressed. I don't care where you've come from. But I'm going to saturate you with a genuine move of the Spirit. That's the kind of church. Come on, young person. That's the kind of church that you're in. Is there anybody that's going to stand for truth? That when you leave this place, you're going to say, God, I will stand for the truth. I'm not going to be trendy. I'm not going to be fashionable. Come on, young person. Pour your heart out. Pour your heart out to it. God, help me stay in the truth. I will not be tempted with anything else. Come on, pour your heart out. Pour your heart out. You need to make a commitment tonight. I give myself to you, Jesus. I give myself to you, Jesus. I shut the Yes. Come on, touch him. God, I'm gonna be different. I want God culture. I don't want pop culture. I want God culture. I don't need trend. I need truth. Keep me focused. Keep me focused. Help me to believe in who I am. Help me to be proud 
of who I am.